Welcome to the Circuit of Success Podcast. The Circuit of Success Podcast. With your host, Brett. Brett. Brett Gilliland. Brett Gilliland, visionary wealth advisor. Brett Gilliland. The Circuit of Success Podcast. Let's start the show. Welcome to the Circuit of Success. I am your host, Brett Gilliland, and today I've got Marco Bookbinder with me. Marco, how you doing? Excellent, Brett. How you doing? I'm doing great. You know, we've got uh, we've got this tie together we talked about before we recorded of this Boston Red Sox versus Cardinals. You know, you've got us a couple times here. What was that? Oh, uh, oh, four in 2013 in the World Series. But that's OK. It doesn't stop us from having a wonderful podcast. Absolutely not. Two storied franchises. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think that, you know, you're, a baseball fan is, is a baseball fan throughout. Uh, so, no, absolutely. We just hope we can get back to those days. We've had a tough couple of years here in St. Louis that we're not used to, so we're we're look we're looking forward to being back to those times. Likewise, likewise. Yes, absolutely. Well, you are the CEO of Ampliforce, uh, which is an artificial intelligence firm. Uh, by deploying digital workers to handle tedious manual tasks, so humans can focus on more impactful roles. Ampliforce improves organizational productivity while increasing job satisfaction and retention. That's some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today is your company. You are also an author, the book called The AI Agent Mandate. We will talk about that in a little bit. But like I do on every show, Marco, is I like to talk about what's made you the man that you are today. Well, let's see. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, humility, um, you know, great, great family, great faith, um, and blessed by really being shaped by decades worth of um, customers interactions uh, across the globe, um, which, uh, you know, have uh, helped stay and still what I like to think are my, my main traits or, or core, what's core to me, which is um, try to be as, as open-minded um, as possible, uh, never prejudge, uh, be a great listener, and uh, and that applies quite a bit, particularly when you start working globally um, and have to deal not only with understanding who you have in front of you, but also understand a bit the context, what makes them tick, uh, their culture, and what have you. It makes it interesting, more challenging, yeah. but, but but makes you a little bit more, I think, uh, open to ad- adapting and, and accepting people, uh, uh, you know, as a result. Yeah. So, so you obviously are a well-traveled man here. I mean, I was looking at my notes here and you, uh, says a global citizens held five international assignments in Milan, Rome, Vienna, Vienna, Buenos Aires, and London, uh, personally implemented and been a board member of several international joint ventures in Mexico, Brazil, UK, Egypt, India, Japan, and China. And you speak four languages, which that's incredible. Um, but what have you learned most about the world for the well-traveled man that you are? What have you learned the most about the world and about people? You know, at the end of the day, what I've learned is that we're all very similar. What's different, though, is um, is the context in terms of how each of us has been brought up. Um, and that has to do with, you know, economical circumstances all the way to social uh, circumstances, uh, cultural, historical, and what have you. And um, as I said before, that, that plays even more so, say, if if you're all of a sudden in a customer meeting in Vienna or in Seoul or in Sao Paulo, um, it's, you you need to understand the person and understand the context to the extent that you spend time understanding the context, their culture, you're going to be that much more effective in communicating with them. It's when you try to take shortcuts and disregard the culture, even if the person across from you, in Mexico City is speaking the same language, that's when uh, the communication becomes a bit more challenging. And so I found that, you know, working in in these different countries has really shaped me to become a much more open-minded person, a greater communicator. Um, And I think it's so important in today's society where where you do have, uh, you know, a lot of division um, without getting into politics, Brett. Yep. And ultimately, if you if if everybody was a bit more open minded and, and respected everybody, um, 
for, for what they stand for, uh, communication uh, and relationships could be dramatically better. And, and that's kind of the formula I applied from the very first time I set foot in a foreign country. Yeah. So what made you, uh, and what, first off, what four languages do you speak? Well, so I sp Italian's my first language. I, I moved to the States when I was eight. Um, and then I moved back for work to Italy when I was 22. So Italian, then English, uh, French, and Spanish. Okay. And when you're in meetings, are you using those languages or do you, do you, uh, how does that work? So it's, so it's interesting over the, in, in the, in the late nineties and the two thousands, I would use more of those languages over time. English has become much more predominant across the globe, as you know. Um, but in, in meetings where those languages apply, I will certainly look to do my very best to apply those, uh, to the extent yeah. that everyone is speaking that, that local language. And, and it, and again, it goes, it goes well. Um, it's very effective when, from a business perspective, but it's the ability to speak that local language so that you can also personalize your, your interaction. Um, that makes a big, big difference. Even when you're not hundred percent fluent in a given language, the effort it shows is says quite a bit of a person. Yeah. So I want to talk about the, uh, so obviously being the CEO of Ampliforce, uh, artificial intelligence firm, I want to talk about, we're going to go something real basic first. Okay. So we can, uh, stuff that you can do in your sleeping, like, why am I answering these questions on this guy's podcast? But so talk about AI as from a leadership standpoint, as a, just a normal human being today in the world that we live in here in America, what, what is AI? Obviously, we know it's artificial intelligence, but what is it and how should people be thinking about AI in their everyday lives? So, so the way I, I think about AI is, um, is a set of tools that help augment um, your productivity as an individual. And that could be in areas of um, decision making. It could be in the areas of automating certain processes that are very manually intensive or document intensive. Um, it could be in the areas of um, integrating data from disparate sources and providing it to you on one screen so that you can take decisions faster, as an example. So imagine it's a set of tools and approaches uh, to help augment your your productivity as an as an individual okay and so when you think of like ai you know the big one obviously is chat gpt so um are you seeing that and then obviously there's other stuff that's way bigger better than that or what's what's the main source of ai that you think the the normal person listening to this podcast is using today yeah i, I would say that uh Generator of AI and tools, including ChatGPT, certainly over the last year, have taken you know the the, the country by storm, right? And then I believe that at this point in time, quite many uh, white collar workers have certainly uh, tested out, I would say, a, a type of generated AI such as ChatGPT, and um, and. You know, to me, that's that's uh, an incredible capability that it's been brought forward to, you know, help, you know, could be create content all the way to um, in dramatically enhance the search, the search function that that has been around for probably the last 20 years. So I would say, yes, that's probably the, 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 the most common tool that I would say is is purely artificial intelligence based. Okay. And, and I, in talking with you, I heard you say one time that you think and uh, potentially think AI would be more transformative than the internet. I mean, that's a big statement, right? I mean, the internet has been a big, big deal for uh, businesses and people all over the world. So is AI going to be more transformative than the internet? Um, I, I do believe so. And certainly equal if, if not greater and the reason being is that when you consider the our day-to-day -day jobs right regardless of the type of jobs that one does um, there's still 
a really meaningful percentage of your day-to-day -day jobs and tasks that you do, regardless of your profession, that are still manually intensive or document intensive. And with today's advancements in, in AI and further advancements and the pace of innovation has never been greater, um, there's now an incredible opportunity to become more efficient and more productive as an individual by relying on various types of AI to either do market research for you, to create content for you, uh, to automate processes for you, and, and, and down the line. And that is, um, and, and therefore that will impact your your day-to-day -day work life, but also your, your personal life equally. Um, and so I believe strongly that um, for those that choose to harness AI, their, their, both their jobs and lives can be dramatically improved. So walk me through kind of as an expert, I'm gonna call you an expert. You didn't say that, I said that in, in artificial intelligence is my biggest fear is for the, the next generation, our kids, right? I have a 19, uh, 19, 17, 14 and 10 year old. My fear for them is, is that will it, will it prohibit them and stop them from having deep thinking? Cause they can just go to this thing, type it in and it thinks for them. So what are your thoughts on that, on how that's going to play out in the human side? And then also for the kids that they're going to grow up with this. You and I did not grow up with this, right? So this is all new to us. Um, so how do you, when you hear me say that, what comes to mind for you? Yeah. So listen, I think everybody shares those concerns, uh, including myself, um, in terms of, you know, how, how do people harness and leverage technology in a way to make it more productive, but not to, uh, say, make it much more dependent on that technology or where they, they stop thinking all of, all of a sudden. Right. Um, and so I think it's going to be a balancing act. That's the reality. Um, the in, initially, you know, I've, even for my own kids, I've, I've advocated for them to uh, play out, pl play, play with these different tools, leverage them um, for their their strengths, understanding that they still have a lot of gaps, and so. Um, in some cases on the research side, there's always going to be a need for human intervention to validate whether the information is 100% accurate or not, depending on which tool you use. Um, some of these tools, not ours, but it, some of these tools, generically speaking, have been trained on the internet data. We all know that maybe 60 to 70% of the internet data is, is not accurate, right? And right. so by definition, you, you can't advise uh, your kids to to take verbatim the output of, of these tools but can these tools make them more efficient for sure could they can these tools help create them a, a uh, an outline for sure could these tools help collect research that may have not been accessible through the standard search tools in the past for sure but then it's, it's up to us as, as parents and, and, and teachers um, and employers to expect that there's a roles and, re and responsibility that the students still need to do their work, um, come up with their own thesis um, and, um, and, and, and do fully the work rather than to rely, to rely on the machine. Um, the, it's, I, don't, I do believe that that's, uh, it's a coexistence of sorts and, 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 uh, and needs to be leveraged. Now, are people going to take advantage of it fully where some students will use uh, ChatGPT and, and to produce an entire paper? Certainly, but that's, that's possibly a different issue altogether that sure. either the parents, hopefully, or the teacher can instill those right guidelines from the very beginning. But I, I would It's also not... a character issue, right? 100%, 100%. It's a character issue and, um, and, and, and that can only be instilled by, by parents, I believe. It's, it's the, the role of the parents to instill that from early on. Um, but I know also schools um, are being very proactive about it where they're yeah. not prohibiting the tools from being accessed, but they're setting guidelines from the very first day at school in terms of expectations and and people are in, in forcing students to actually sign this kind of code of conduct if you follow me and and um, 
and that's that's the only way I think uh, you can stay ahead, right? You you can't eliminate these tools or prevent folks from from not accessing those tools because in so doing it puts them also at a disadvantage. Yeah, I'm going to butcher the quote, but I heard recently it said, "AI will not replace humans, but humans that." understand and embrace AI will replace those humans, right? So when you hear me say that, heck, you may have been the guy that told me that. I don't remember, but somebody told me that. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, couldn't agree with you more. And, and in fact, you know, the the book, um, the book that I recently um, finished is, is really talks about how there's, there's a the problem I try to frame in the book is, is what I call the perfect labor storm. So when you look at it from a macroeconomist perspective, the, the global labor pool is shrinking, right? So you hear instead that AI is going to take, take over jobs, which it will for sure. But you don't, you hear less the fact that if you're a company, your, your, your labor pool is shrinking and that's due to yeah. great resignation, quiet quitting, aging population, and so if that's the case, that means that if you want to survive and be transformative and continue to succeed as a company, you can't continue doing the same things you've done in the past in terms of trying to outbid your local uh, competitors for that same talent. You need to switch it up. And what I advocate in the book in terms of switching it up is looking at AI as, as not as tools, but as if it's a new form of an employee a collaborative employee, but getting a bit to your question. What does that mean? Well, imagine if you had an employee that worked 24 by seven, handled all the mundane tasks, the error prone tasks, the document intensive tasks, so that you in turn as a, as a human employee could actually do more meaningful tasks for your company, could uh, help take some, spend more time doing strategic decisions versus what the average employee does today, which depending on which research you look at, uh, states that uh, knowledge workers are saddled with anywhere between 30 to 50 percent of their week on administrative on administrative tasks. So if you look at it in that context, so if someone told you, Brett, hey, Brett, would would you, would you be willing to work with a new colleague if that colleague took away 20 to 30 or 40 percent of the tasks, administrative tasks you do on a weekly basis, which, by the way, nothing personal, but you're not very good at because sure. it's, it's volume. So you, you, you're still creating a lot of errors because you're probably not into it because it's pretty boring stuff. What if that colleague takes that over for you so I can actually focus you on more meaningful areas of the company. Therefore, you'll make a bigger impact to the company, which means that I can actually promote you faster. And in fact, actually give you a bonus at the end of the year because my productivity as a company has increased. Would you be willing to work with that worker, the new employee? Yes. And I bet you nine out of 10 people, if not 10 out of 10 people would say absolutely. And then when you say, well, who, where's that colleague? That colleague you know, happens to be called an AI agent. Do you, do you follow me? It's an AI yeah, agent, but at this yeah. point, you don't you don't care. So that's really the that's really I think the opportunity here, which is um, embracing embracing AI will make those people who are embracing them uh, more amplified, more productive in a way, right? They should be more yeah. successful. They should be more. The employee satisfaction should go through the roof. Um, and so that's ultimately why I believe that everyone should embrace AI um, as long as, you know, they can leverage it to become more productive, but also with an open mindset. And what I mean by that is as long as they're willing to, in some cases, be reskilled, Brett, or upskilled, um, because in some cases that's going to be required. Yeah. So is that where Ampliforce would come in, right? So a person like me and owning a company, we've got 60 something employees and 
you know, like let's even take, you know, CRM, right? There's data, right? I go out and I, let's say you were going to become my client and I get a bunch of data on you. Um, now there's a side of it that has to be confidential that we can't share, right? So that is a human input. Um, but then, but how does that work? So even take wealth management out of it. How are you going in as Ampliforce and building these quote unquote employees, right? These agents and making them understand the work that needs to be done in that company? Yeah, it starts with uh, doing a very uh, brief, takes no more than a day assessment uh, and understanding of, of how you, the task that you're currently considering hiring a, an AI agent for, how's that task done today? So it could be on the marketing side, could be manufacturing, finance, doesn't matter, but it's, it's really understanding how is it done today? And, and it's, it, the goal is to capture all the tasks that are done to get that task done. It could be surfing a website, collecting some information, um, exporting that information, putting it into an Excel, maybe putting that Excel into a CRM, whatever that might be. But imagine it, it, listing out those tasks. And then on the back of that, in a matter of a couple of days, we will give you a proposal for how we would need to customize our AI agent to uh, help increase the productivity of that task of yours. Yeah. And so, and so um, all that can be done in a matter of a week. And now you have a customized agent that would be deployed that already integrates with your systems, is, has already been custom tuned uh, to collaborate with your existing employees. And, uh, and now you can get that productivity enhancements. But, you know, some of our agents, uh, for instance, are, are you know, are, have been deployed to, to do research on prospects. Um, and so, you know, you could be uh, a, uh, a company in, in the asset management space, you're looking to sell your, your funds uh, to pension funds and uh, pension plans. And, 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 uh, but there's a lot of research that needs to go on to understand the pension plans, how they've invested money in the past, who they've selected, what's the performance to date, Imagine if you could have an AI agent that collects all that information, summarizes it for your salesperson, and then another agent actually advises your salesperson based on that research, which fund to position. And then imagine another agent actually constructs the proposal Jeez. or the PowerPoint for your, for your sales rep. And it's highly relevant to, you know, to, to, to the buying, uh, history of, of, of your prospect and highly relevant to having selected the right product that's going to be most successful based on performance. So that's an example of, of sales, a, a sales, a, a series of sales assistants that are AI agent that, again, don't do 100% of the work for your staff. They just augment your yeah. staff by, by, by collecting that information very, very accurately. Well, that's what I was going to say. There's still that human element there that right now I'm not the one physically doing the research as that startup person in our firm, uh, but I'm managing that process to get it from A to B to Z, right, to get it done. And so it, what it does, it elevates me, gets the job done quicker and gives me a more of a, of a leadership role with that. Is that fair to say? 100%. Yeah, it's and the neat thing about these agents, Brett, is that um, – before they, before they execute each step, they can report back into your human supervisor of that agent. And it's in, so that the human supervisor can review the work of that agent. And if he or she approves it, then they can hit a button and have that agent now go on to step number two. Yeah. And, and so you have that constant check-in um, process so that the knowledge workers, the human employees feel comfortable and can start trusting this agent, but also guide that agent because that agent, uh, based on the coaching and the input provided by the, the human supervisor, will get better over time thanks to uh, capabilities of, of machine learning. And so um, the way we configure our, our agents are really meant to be very, very collaborative um, with the human employees versus, you know, some vendors out there just have a black box where right. 
you know it's AI, you have no idea how the information is generated and you have to trust it or not. And, uh, but you don't know the steps that it took. That's not what we advocate because ultimately at the end of the day, um, th this is about human psychology and everything is based on trust. And, and you have to be able to audit these, these workers, these agents, um, and, and people need to be, feel, feel in control in order for them to really feel like they want to embrace and, and leverage this new form of employee or assistant. Yeah. So let's let's un unpack that box a little bit more. You talked about the uh, aging workforce. You know, there's they call it the aging or the, uh, the the great resignation, right? The aging populations out there. So let's dive a little deeper into that and get your thoughts and philosophy on what's going on there. Um, so it's 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 interesting. The in almost every different country um, is is having you know, big, big concerns about the accelerated pace of their, their population from an aging perspective, and certainly what that will do in terms of the system, um, you know, healthcare system, uh, retirement and what have you. Um, but there's also a big challenge in terms of all that knowledge that those, uh, employees will take away with them. And, um, and so, you know, from a company perspective is how do you manage your resource plan, you know, two, three, four, five years out, understanding that aging population, great resignation that, that really accelerated with COVID. And, you know, there's also this quiet quitting, which is People may be being less enthused with their with their job at hand. They're not going to you as a boss to say, "Hey, listen, Brett, I'm 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 really burned out um, for a number of reasons." They're they're just passively quitting, so to speak, doing their job, but just enough. And all of these factors impact dramatically productivity, uh, retention, employee satisfaction, um, and and. And the, the companies that really want to take that, on, take that on are the ones that will have to reimagine how work is done as opposed to thinking, hey, I'll just try to f find someone else or I'll try to hire and compete for, for that limited yeah. and more limited talent. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely going to be interesting. I mean, it's to see where this whole AI thing shakes out in the companies and then uh, the other, one of the other things that I worry about, um, and, and help me understand this too, and I'd love to hear your philosophy on this, is how many of the, and let's just take something simple, like a magazine, a sports, a sports illustrated isn't around anymore. So we'll, we'll pick on them. I mean, how many writers do you believe today are going out and just having all these articles written by AI? So I worry about the authentic, the uh, being authentic, right? So maybe being authentic. That's why I love these, uh, these types of podcasts and video content is you can't AI what you and I are doing right now. I'm going to get to know Marco, right? We're going to dive into some of the things you've chosen to do personally and professionally in a bit, but like the authenticity for me is a big deal. So like, how, how do we overcome that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and authenticity is going to be more and more difficult to prove over time, but that's, that's, a, you know, another, another topic for another day, possibly Brett, but yeah. I would say that, I would say that, um, AI is, is, is alarmingly getting better and better, not just at aggregating research that a writer would, 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 would seek to do on his or her own but also these days you can actually adapt the tone yeah, and the writing style is to make it more dramatic versus sensationalist or what have you. And, um, and so I think for a time being though, there's an opportunity still for the writer to imagine spend less time on the primary research, which the AI can, can do. Mm -hmm. Um, and more time on hopefully doing interviews, right? Uh, because if you think about res the research and the context of creating an article, it, collecting the facts is something that uh, is to me is still mundane, meaning I'd be okay 
providing or having the AI or the agent collect that information. But then what do I do with that time? If, if that allows me to spend more time interviewing you, going back to your point about authenticity, interviewing maybe more um, subjects that I wasn't planning to because initially my deadline was such that I was going to spend most of my time doing research. But if it instead means that I can actually spend more time interviewing and then more time pulling the research collected from the AI, collecting the input from my interviews and actually putting my finishing touch on it. Yeah. I would argue potentially that could be a better product at the end. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Now yep. you get, but you're going to have still people who say, Oh, Marco's putting a positive spin on it. Um, I'm not trying to, I'm just, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about it more from a mindset though of, you know, I never anticipated a question like that. So how did I come up with that? Because I, my mindset has said, okay, if I was a writer and if I was open to working with an AI agent to augment me, how would I define tasks that are less value add in versus the tasks that are more value add? Do you follow me? And so that's how I so, got I mean, to that. I mean, made me think about a ghostwriter, right? I mean, authors have had ghostwriters for years, right? Most, most, I shouldn't say most. There's a lot of authors that work with somebody else to write the book and then put their name on it, right? That's a ghostwriter. So that, that ghostwriter could be your agent writer, right? 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So let's turn the page a little bit to uh, obviously a successful uh, person like yourself. There, There's always ideas running through your brain, right? There's ideas that you could you could have 15 more businesses if you wanted to. If you're, if you're like me, you're always thinking of stuff. But also great opportunities come across your desk. So how do you slow down enough to process all of that data personally to make the right decision to build your business that you started uh, and do the things that you're doing today with all the ideas and all the things coming across your desk yeah brett it's not easy it's not easy let me start there versus you know pretending that i got it i got it all under control and then here's my <laughs> full proof of formula um, and it's not easy because of the fact that the pace of innovation has never been greater. Yeah. And so, and so when technology is, is enhanced at the pace that we're seeing today, it just naturally opens up to more and more opportunities. So in the context of our business as a company that offers fully configured AI agents, that means that as these agents acquire more and more skills, and when I say skills, I'm talking about, again, imagine reading, decisioning, processing, whatever skills that those may be. Now, all of a sudden, you can start thinking about, well, we could apply those agents to healthcare and revenue cycle management. Or, hey, you know, we could apply those to uh, you know, those skills to uh, train operators who are looking to improve predictive maintenance on their uh, trains. Mm -hmm. and, and so those opportunities happen more and more and more. And, and so as a, you know, as a company, um, the only way you can manage that is, is, is retaining, tr stay true to your mission as a, as a company and, and your focus area within the strategy. And that means that um, you, you have to ensure that your, your team is, is focused on the areas that you have um, researched, put an operating plan in place and an executing against. Um, what I do a little bit different, what we do a little bit different is, is, is having say 90% of, of the company focused on the business at hand for which, you know, we researched, got aligned on in terms of strategy and are executing against, and then 10% imagine is, is a, uh, is, a, is a much more smaller team that handles net new opportunities in a very, um, in a, in a very rigorous process oriented manner to determine whether those opportunities are make sense for us to take on make sense for us to possibly partner and give to partners or 
don't make sense for us to pursue at all. Yeah. And, um, and, and I apply that same kind of principle also to my life and, and, and it, because it, 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 uh, it can become very overwhelming if, uh, the opportunities there, whether it be, Hey, to, to join in a board, maybe a speaking opportunity, um, could be writing another book, whatever the opportunities are. Um, I think they the challenge has never been greater because of the innovation. Um, and because in general, uh, your the distractions are even greater, right? Because of, uh, the technology that we have at our fingertips. Yeah. Pretty crazy, isn't it? So how do you manage Marco, right? So you, you can't manage time, but you can manage yourself. And, and so how do you, do you have processes in place throughout your day? I call it being boringly consistent. I, I pretty much do the same thing every morning. Uh, what's that like for you to have, uh, you know, success in your life? Yeah, so it's, it's, um, it starts with my morning routine, right? And it's getting up always at the same hour, typically about 5.30, um, it's meditating. Um, I love it because I think meditating allows me to, uh, get more control of myself at the, from the very beginning of the day, it slows, um, it slows everything down for me and allows me to think clearly. So after meditating, uh, I, I write on a sheet of paper, you know, what I really want to achieve that day. Um, and then it goes to my, uh, you know, intense, intense workout and, uh, which varies day to day. Um, you do that at home or do you go someplace? I, I do that at home when I, when I'm not traveling and, uh, just to maximize the time yep. and, uh, and, uh, and I'm, and I track, I track all my activity, whether it's meditation, nutrition, uh, fitness, sleep, um, with, with, uh, you know, a, a pretty advanced, um, you know, fitness, uh, fitness, uh, a band, uh, whoop. which in turn, which in turn gives me all these metrics on, is it a whoop? It, it is. Okay. Yeah. It's great. And, and to me, um, that allows me really to be data driven. It's as if I had a, a doctor who, who listened to every single salt or tracked every single solitary thing I did from my sleep to when I went to sleep, to, uh, to what, what I ate, uh, to the intensity of my workout, to my meditations, to when I, when I finished eating at night, when did I have a couple of drinks and be able to correlate all that information in, into providing a report. And so, by opting into this survey, which I do every morning, my journal, journal with the yep. tool, now you're combining the most intense data with, now you're providing context to that data by, by you know, filling out that journal, which then gives you at the end of the month, the most customized report possible yeah. on, on your wellness. And so. You think I'm, 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 I'm doing an advertising now for Whoop, but the point is... <laughs> People I, listen to this podcast know I've advertised for Whoop for years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no no affiliation whatsoever. But the point is that that mirrors kind of my kind of data-driven kind of style, uh, the wellness, uh, the great appreciation for wellness. And then uh, going back to, you know, after my workout, it's it's all, always trying to practice um, the the practice of, of being grateful or uh, and... Uh, we can't do that enough. Um, I believe I was taught that early on. And I think with social media these days, it's so easy, and not just social media, to compare yourself against others. Or even if you don't want to compare yourself, you, you people, you know, volunteer everything that they're doing, their material achievements and what have you. And uh, if instead you can just be grateful for your health, uh, the people that you have around your, you, the fact that you have been granted the opportunity to live, a, a, you know, a day, uh, that yeah. given day is, is so important. And, and these are all practices, by the way, Brett, I don't want to make it seem like, Hey, I, I've got it nailed. I'll never have everything nailed. I'm always learning. I'm trying to improve. Uh, but by having this discipline every day, 
it allows me to get through the day as, as best as possible um, and uh, finish at the end of the day, which is critical for me, hopefully feeling like I've, I've accomplished what I said to what I said my day to accomplish. Not, and again, not just from a business perspective, but in terms of the personal side. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. It, it, obviously, you haven't listened to every uh, podcast I have because I've, I've done the podcast. Right. And so um, it's amazing to me how many people that are at the top of their game. Right. And, and that doesn't for me, it doesn't just mean monetarily. Right. At the top of their game is certainly that's part of it, but is flexibility. Right. It's it's freedom. It's working within the purpose you have for your life and, and doing the things that you love to do and traveling with your loved ones and like that's what I would call quote unquote rich, right? Is being able to do those things that you want to do. And it's amazing to me time in, I mean, every Monday we release a podcast time and time again, it's they get up, they exercise, they meditate, they practice gratitude, they have a process, right? And there is no silver bullet, right? There's no magic bullet that's going to fix this thing, but have a process. And what I said earlier, be boringly consistent. You just got to show up and do it every day. Doesn't mean you love it. It doesn't mean you want to do it every day, but you got to be boring. You got to show up. Because for me, when I win my morning, I win my day. When I win that day, I win the next day. I win the next week. I win the next week, the next month, the next month, the next quarter, the next quarter, the next year, the next year, the next decade, right? And and But it all goes back to today, right? Does it, I don't care what you did yesterday. What are you going to do today, right? So when you hear me say it like that, what comes to mind for you? I mean, I, I love it. it. It resonates and it's, it's uh, what I try to inculcate in my, in my boys and, and whoever I have in front of me that I'm, that is seeking a mentor, which is it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the process, right? It's, it's getting to that outcome, right? It's the journey. It's not the end result though. You know, again, society, focuses so much on the end results and uh and uh that's that's not it's just not reality and um and so i i it's about embracing it's 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 acknowledging and embracing the fact that every every day starts again right it starts again and you have to put the effort in but not because but don't look at it as a chore it's it's embracing and being grateful that you, that you're alive, being grateful that you have your health, being grateful that you have a plan for the day and try to execute it to the best of your ability. Um, and, and I like what you just said in terms of like showing up, I, I tell my boys and I try to show them all the time. And it's, there are many times where I, I, I don't, I don't have the energy to go out to, to a business dinner or, um, I'm invited to, to an event and I can make 20 excuses for not, not, not to show up, but it's uncanny. When I show up, Brett, something happens it's amazing. and it, it's amazing. And, and I will come home and I'll tell my wife, yeah, I, I had three different excuses in my head as to why I wasn't going to go to that dinner. I, I showed up, I went there and I met the neatest person, right? And, and right. this happened and, and, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wish I was taught what we're discussing about much earlier in life. I, yeah. I picked that up over the years and, um, but it's so important and, um, uh, and it's, it's the process, it's the day to day routine and, and even the best athletes, uh, out there. Uh, espouse the same so that's that's the secret to the success there's there are no shortcuts yeah i always say just get out and play in traffic right just go play in the traffic good things will happen when good things happen or good people are doing good things good things happen so how, how do you how do you deal with the self-talk i think we've all i call it the roommate we've all got up here right that can be a really bad person sometimes and tells you i don't want to get up at 5 30 in the morning when that alarm goes off or i don't want to go to that dinner or i don't want to make that call are you able to just to do it because you've done it for so long or like, what was that process like for you to battle through the, the negative self-talk to get where you want to get? First of all, I'm, I'm still battling it. And uh, <laughs> I think we all are. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, um, I mean, a couple of, a couple of thoughts come to mind. One is David Goggins, who I'm a huge fan of, who, um, 
who often says, and, and, and uh, I won't be able to represent exactly how he says it, but you know, basically uh, when you're working out and you're exhausted, you think you've, you've done the 10th, you know, the 10th bench uh, rep, uh, he would say, are you going to listen to your domesticated voice? And says, okay, I'm, I'm a wimp, I'm, I'm tired, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just get to 10. Or are you going to uh, listen to uh, you know, your true voice, right? And it's like, go for it until you can't do it the last one. Yeah. And, and that's such like a basic concept. But I remember listening to him the first time or reading that uh, one of his books. And then I started working out and all of a sudden I started listening to that voice. And, and I could hear Goggins say... Who are you going to listen to, Marco? And yeah. and I'm you know I'm a I'm a fighter and, and I don't like to lose and kind of that's kind of my competitiveness. So I I started doing more reps and so um, I would say that the voice is always there and um, but it's it's like learning a new language. It's like trying to lose weight. It's like whatever goal you set for yourself, you have to work at it. Um, even when you try to start meditating at the very beginning of time, you, you have so many thoughts that go through your head and you have to work at, on trying to eliminate those thoughts and what have you. And so I try to every day work on the neutralizing the voice, um, the negativity, um, and instead visualizing for success. And, and that requires self-talk in terms of... Um, positive, positive thought process. And, 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 uh, and, uh, and in the past, I thought that was a bunch of baloney, to be honest with you, Brett. So that's the reason why I didn't do it. Yeah. Uh, I just, I just thought, okay, that sounds good, but that's, I'm a realist. Uh, but then I started really, um, you know, visualizing success and practicing it and positive self-talk, minimizing the negative uh, voice, and it works. Um, yeah. And this is for someone who's, I, I would consider myself fairly skeptical about, you, you know, those, those, those kind of uh, practices and approaches. But uh, I, I don't know if it's making sense, but it's... Oh, 100% it's, it's, making it's, sense. It's, and it's, I couldn't connect more with every it. Day, Brett. It's a battle yeah. every day. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm cognizant of the battle. And I, and I, and I think it's so important to, you know, to, to have the right self-talk that i make it a priority. Whereas in the past, I just accepted it. Yeah. Well, and that's why I asked the question, right? We could come on these podcasts and people listen and like, Oh, the, you know, these two guys got it figured out <laughs> BS, right? No, there's constantly self-talk, right? Of I don't want to do this or I don't want to do that. But again, it's just showing up and it's doing it. And for me, it's, you know, the circuits of success are your attitude, your belief system, your actions that ultimately get your results. So that belief system for me is huge, right? Because it is a choice. That alarm goes off. It is a choice if I'm going to get up. There's nothing else. You can't argue it. It is a choice. And I'm either going to choose to do it and win, or I'm going to choose not to do it. Doesn't mean you still can't win, but I'm putting myself behind the eight ball now, right? And that's why I asked the question because I, I struggle with it. I struggle with it all the time. And uh, But I it, it's funny because... I connect with you on the David Goggins thing. You know, you can do one more rep. You can do one more thing, right? Is the other day, so it's getting colder here now in St. Louis. So my pool is, you know, down in the 50s. And, you know, everybody talks about the cold plunge. And I do it. And, you know, here and there, I hate it. But I always feel like a million bucks when I'm done. And it was like 47 degrees outside. I got done working out. I walk out to my backyard. And I tell myself, I'm going to do it. And I, I kept telling And I didn't want to do it at all. And I said, you can do hard things. I'm literally saying this out loud. Like if somebody's watching me from afar, like this guy's an idiot, like you can do hard things. You can do hard. And I just kept walking down the steps into the pool. And I just like this sense of like, I can do this. And then, you know, you get in, I go under to my, up to my neck. And I'm like, you know, I thought I was going to die for a second because I couldn't breathe for about 20 seconds, but I did it. Right. And it was all the self-talk of, I can do it. Thoughts. Hundred percent, and I have to say, I um, I'm not sure why, but I enjoy creating new challenges for myself. And part of it is is the cold plunge. Uh, I started doing that after reading uh, you know a number of books from Wim, Wim Hof, and yeah. and I can tell you, I'm a wimp, 
breadth because some people can just jump in. Um, and it's almost like looking at a syringe and then knowing that it's, it's, you, you'll be fine, but it's, it's all, it's all leading up to seeing that syringe <laughs> and, and looking the other way. And I'll tell you the cold plunge, I, uh, I struggle with that and, uh, and it's self-talk, self-talk. And, um, it's always the same thing. Similarly, in terms of the breathing, the Wim Hof breathing, yep. it's another challenge, right? Where. Um, talking about voices and, and also your physical body when you're restraining it from actual breathing. And uh, sometimes I, you know, my wife will say, what are you doing yourself this to yourself? <laughs> because I, because maybe I am a bit demented, uh, who knows, or, or, or like to be challenged, but ultimately I'm trying to, uh, you know, explore the, the bounds and, and I don't want to make it myself like I'm, 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 I'm a, you know, agonistical individual, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to continuously push the boundaries within, within a certain uh, limit of, of my body, because I know that, you know, I want to, I want to live life to the fullest in as long as possible in an active way. And, uh, and all these are small little lessons and experiences that are not always yeah. going to be positive but they just help build that confidence and, and build additional perspective. So um, I, I love the fact that you do the cold plunge and, and, yeah. uh, and uh, maybe these, but I'll always be a wimp. I will guarantee you that one. I'm the same, water. man. I hate cold water. I hate it when I'm on vacation, my kids in the pool is a little cold, you know, I'm like, what the hell am I doing to myself? All right. Closing up here. Let's talk about the book, the AI agent mandate. I pulled it up here on, uh, Amazon. I'm going to have that thing probably by, you know, says uh, reimagining work in the age of AI. And uh, I'll probably have it here. Let's see what's it say by Saturday. So uh, by now, you've got a book purchase right here. And uh, tell us about the book. What made you uh, do it and uh, take the time to choose to take the time to write the book for everybody? Well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, for buying a copy, Brett. Um, the, the reason I I, I chose to write it is because, and we've talked about it before already, uh, so I won't belabor the point, but um, the way we take advantage of technology, this has been true for the last 50 years, is we buy tools, right? We buy tools. And typically when you buy tools, you are limiting yourself in terms of creativity, what you can do with that tool based on what that tool can do. So when you read the instructions and it gives you, hey, these are the capabilities, you, you naturally try to constrain your creativity to those capabilities. And so when I thought about AI and I, and I knew it was going to be very transformative, um, I thought about it in terms of, well, how can you, how can people accelerate the adoption and the leveraging of this transformative power called AI. And again, you know, the concept that we've been developing for the last four years is the concept of not looking at AI as a tool or set of tools, but if instead imagine if you thought of it as an employee, a, new, a very talented employee, like I talked about before, 24 mm -hmm. by seven, highly efficient, commits very little errors, highly coachable, audible, what have you. Um, that's a paradigm shift, right? Um, and, uh, you know, soon I'll, I'll be speaking with a, uh, a nonprofit, one of the leading, uh, nonprofit organizations trying to tackle global poverty. And, um, they've asked me to come in and, and ask them to, to see how they can leverage AI more. And my first point will be, don't consider AI as tools, though. Ultimately they obviously are tools, but if instead someone said, Hey, Brett, I'm going to provide you, I know you have resource constraints in terms of your nonprofit. If you could, where would you hire in order to make a bigger impact? And so now all of a sudden you're thinking about, well, I would want an employee that does this function, an employee that does that function. And that's kind of now you're looking at an employee side. And so yeah. the book is really meant to, uh, one, tell you, hey, there's this massive perfect labor uh, storm, which means that you're going to have a limited resource pool in the future. And therefore, in order for you to leverage this transformative capability in AI, don't look at it as tools, but pretend it's an employee. We, we call it an AI agent, like a lot mm -hmm. of other players do. 
And if you look at it as an employee, um, that's when you can really not be limited or constrained in terms of your creativity, in terms of how you would work with that employee in order to make you and your company more productive. So really the goal is it's, it's a practical handbook. It's not technical. It won't, it doesn't talk about coding. It's, it's really talking about a organizational transformation of sorts and how to hire this new type of employee in order to make the most profound impact to your organization. Love it. Love it. Well, I'll be getting my copy this Saturday. So I look forward to reading that. We'll put it all in the show notes. People can find out where the book is. Where can our listeners find more of you, Marco? So I have, um, a, a website uh, called marcobookbinder.com. Very, very original, as, as you would uh, think. And uh, that is, um, you know, just a, a, a pretty basic uh, site that tells you a little more about uh, me, uh, my thoughts. I, I often post uh, or blog. And uh, if you'd like to reach out, uh, there's contact information as well. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Marco, for being on the Circuit of Success podcast. It's been awesome having you and uh, lots of takeaways. So I appreciate your time. Brett, I'm grateful uh, for you, for your time and for you inviting me and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Absolutely. Stay with me here.